Welcome back to Intro Psychology. We're still talking about the history of psychology and where we left off. We were talking about how structuralism and functionalism were a bit divided through the Atlantic, with the European side focused on more qualitative theories that explained all humans, and the American side focused on more scientific theories and individual differences. How this resolved was really through the popularity of a rising figure in psychology, and that is this man, Sigmund Freud. So let's get to it, talking about Sigmund Freud's legacy in the history of psychology. So Sigmund Freud was not a trained psychologist. He was actually a trained medical researcher living in Austria. But how he entered the psychological uh, area is quite interesting. At his time in history, there were quite a few uh, patients who were experiencing psychosomatic uh, symptoms that no other doctor could resolve. And particularly, it was known that there was many women who were experiencing symptoms like hair loss, nausea, tremors, shakes, and, and doctors could not identify uh, the cause or a sound treatment. In fact, the leading theory at the time was that these women were experiencing hysteria. Hysteria represented the idea that one's uh, uterus was, has left its place and was wandering around the body. That was the best that these doctors could make sense. So Freud, important to know, he was not a Christian, he was Jewish. And that plays a major role as he was working in the Victorian era where Christian ethos was really predominant and people could not talk about things like sexual taboos or sexual fantasies or experiences. Freud being outside of that uh, Christian ethos was able to start talking to these women. And he created what was known as the talking cure. This is the idea that the women were allowed to talk freely about whatever they wanted to talk about, no matter how socially faux pas or how taboo it was. Freud discovered that many of these women had actually experienced sexual abuse or had had extramarital sexual affairs or had uh, non-socially -so approved sexual fantasies. And through letting these women talk about their sexuality, their biological symptoms like nausea, blindness, hair loss started to ease and get better. So because of this, Freud believed that psychology was a form of medicine where one could talk freely about what they needed to to get better. This, this would also prove quite evident after the First World War when troops and veterans were returning from war with the symptom known as shell shock. Shell shock was, now we know, was PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And they had undergone and seen many uh, distressing things in war. And through able to talk about it in a safe space, their symptoms were able to improve. So that was something that has still influenced Freud's legacy. We still understand that talking in a safe space can be very cathartic and good for our mental and biological health. Another major theory of Freud's that still contributes to modern day psychology is his idea of the consciousness. So the iceberg metaphor is typically used for this, and it's the idea that the tip of the iceberg represents just what we're conscious of right now, what we're thinking of, what you would get at if you were introspecting. But there's a lot more to the mind than that. In fact, just below the water, there may be some memories we can retrieve relatively easily, but deep down to the bottom of the iceberg, this is our deep unconscious. And the only way to retrieve that is through uh, detailed and lengthy psychoanalysis. So Freud coined the term psychoanalysis. This is different than just psychology. And it's the idea that it's an analysis of the mind. So he believed that you could get to the unconscious only through long-term psychoanalysis with a trained psychoanalyst like himself. It's the idea that our dreams may give us a preview to the unconscious, uh, but it, it's harder to tap into it. And so these theories still hold up today that sometimes dreams can represent something if you're stressed out or if you're anticipating something. And we do understand psychology that the unconscious is a very important thing, that sometimes there's memories we have a hard time tapping into. However, there's lots of other Freudian theories that don't hold up as well, and it's important for us to briefly acknowledge them uh, uh, as well. And so some of the other Freudian theories that you may have heard about and that are indeed a lot more controversial are things like the id, ego, and superego. The id is thought to be our very impulsive, hedonistic, animalistic side of our personality, someone who just wants immediate pleasure. The superego is considered to be this prudent, temperate, moralistic side of our personality who wants to obey the rules of morality. 
And the ego is the balancing act between the two. Uh, it's the idea that if you ever see in pop culture, the little angel or the devil on the shoulders, those could represent the id and the superego, and the person in the center would be the ego trying to find balance. Another one of Freud's theories, uh, deeply controversial, is that of psychosexual development. Freud believed that by sexual, he was meaning pleasure. And he was meaning that throughout childhood, there was different types of pleasure one would obtain uh, from their environment. Uh, that infants would start off gaining a lot of pleasure from their mouth through sucking uh, and getting nourishment through their mouth. Toddlers would get a lot of pleasure through learning to be toilet trained uh, through the anal stage. And then preschoolers would get a lot of pleasure through understanding their genitals. And so this has been uh, definitely under attack. There are some modern day psychologists who have retweaked this uh, and refocused this a bit. We can obviously see here that Freud is very focused on sexuality. Again, that comes from his work from being able to talk to people about their sexual fantasies and experiences. Uh, and so one of the things that people have, take, have agreed that Freud's just kind of taken this too far are things like the Oedipus complex and penis envy. Oedipus complex comes from uh, the Greek story of Oedipus, and it's the idea that boys will fantasize about marrying their moms to the extent they become jealous of their fathers. And they may actually want to kill their fathers, like Oedipus did, uh, to be with their moms. Another theory branching off from that is penis envy. Freud believed that little boys, if they saw their father's penis, they would become envious of it. And that may lead to distressing feelings towards their dads. He also believed that women would form penis envy towards men uh, because they were lacking. Of course, that has been heavily disproven. Another theory that holds more weight in modern day is that of defense mechanisms. This is the idea that when we are challenged or when something is going to provoke anxiety in us, we can do a number of things to reduce that anxiety. Sometimes we deny the thing provoking anxiety. Sometimes we distract ourselves. Sometimes we turn to artistic endeavors to paint a picture or write a song about the thing causing us anxiety. Sometimes we transfer the pain. Uh, if, if your boss yells at you, sometimes you transfer that and you yell at your kids or you yell at your siblings. And so these are called uh, defense mechanisms which help to reduce our anxiety. Then there's also the notion of psychic energy. Uh, this is the idea that we have a finite or limited amount of energy, uh, like our, our energy for aggression or our energy for our libido and sexual energy. And if you can't use it uh, in a certain way, you will find a socially approved way to use it. So if you have a very high libido, but you can't display that sexually, maybe you'll paint pictures or write music uh, about it. And of course, another legacy of Freud is his interpretation of dreams. And he believed that everything in dreams represented something sexual. That is, if there was an obelisk or a tall tower, he believed that represented a penis. And if there was a tunnel, he believed that represented a vagina. If there was anything round, like round dough and baking a bread, he believed that was representing breasts. He was really in to looking at sex and the consciousness. Now, Freud had a number of followers who were less hung up on these sexual topics. For instance, one of his uh, follow psychoanalysts was Carl Jung. Carl Jung was interested in the unconscious as well, but at a community level. He believed in what he called the collective unconscious. And that is within society, within communities, people had these agreed upon archetypes. Archetypes for Jung were things that we call today tropes or cliches. That is the idea that everyone recognized a hero archetype or a villain archetype, a follower, a leader, a mother, a damsel, and that people could understand this notion. Today in modern society, it's easy to see this in pop culture, in movies, in social media. If somebody makes a quote in a movie, it becomes popular around the globe. And then we can refer to that in our collective unconscious. You can meet someone for the very first time and cite something in a very popular movie scene. And that becomes part of our communal narrative. There's also Alfred Adler. And so he, his, his theory of birth order theory has been disproven, but it hangs in the air uh, in our collective unconscious, if you will, as this idea that the older siblings, the firstborn children will be more conservative, more traditional, more um, uh, overachievers. And the younger children or the later born children will be more clowns and more impulsive and more fun loving. Whereas the middle born children will be the shy introverts. This has been disproven, but it's still really fun to think about. 
Adler's also connected to his idea of the inferiority complex. Although Freud thought that tall towers always represented a penis, Adler said, well, it might be a penis, but it might be something else that a person feels inferior about. Someone who feels inferior about their education or their stature, maybe they're short in stature, maybe they're going to be more likely to build these tall towers or have these flashy cars or try and show all their prestige. And finally, the daughter of Sigmund Freud, Anna Freud, took a lot of his psychoanalytic theories and used them with children, uh, particularly children who had lived through World War II and who had experienced trauma. So she was really interested in the clinical usage and the therapeutic usage of this. And this is still something we use today, particularly with kids to tap into a child's unconscious. Uh, it's often seen through play therapy through giving kids a dollhouse and some representative figures, we can see the narratives children develop through play may represent something the child is currently working through. For instance, if they have a family member who's sick, they may make their dolls play as though one of the dolls is sick. And that may show that they're currently working through the emotions and the thought process associated with that family experience. Now, psychoanalysts would use a specific type of theory. So within psychoanalysis, the psychoanalyst would use a psychoanalytic therapy. This was designed by Freud and his followers, and this was very much a long-term therapy technique. That is, if you signed up for psychoanalytic therapy, you were making an eight to 10 year commitment. And that's because the technique used was largely free association. The patient would lay on a couch and would free associate about anything they were thinking about and nothing taboo was off the table. You could talk about bodily functions. You could talk about desires of, of hurting somebody. Anything was fair game at this point in history. And the therapist would simply sit and listen and perform analysis on what you were saying. And so some of the analysis would be analyzing your dreams. And you can still to this day buy Freudian dream dictionaries that tell you what your dreams meant. It's important to note that the patient or client was not doing the interpreting, the professional was, that this other person was telling you what your dreams meant to you. Other techniques included hypnosis, which was thought to go deeper into the unconscious. And it was also the idea that someone would eventually form transference. That is, if they have a certain type of emotional tension with someone, a parent or a boss, they eventually get that emotional tension with their uh, the psychoanalyst therapist, therapist. It was the idea if somebody has mommy issues, they'll start to have those mommy issues with their therapist. And that this was a way of working out those issues. Finally, something that would not fly today was the idea of pushing towards resistance. If someone did not want to talk about something, they didn't want to free associate about a certain memory. Uh, this was considered to be resistance and psychoanalysts were trained to push harder in this area. Of course, today we would have many ethical concerns about this. And so this brings us to an end of talking about Freud and his followers. Uh, the next one we're going to launch into is behaviorism. And this is really where we jump across the Atlantic again and talk about uh, how the science of psychology was evolving in North America.